We've reviewed Lorelai's giant tiny home, and we've covered Rory's walkable childhood. Until today, I have left Richard and Emily Gilmore alone. But now, we're shining a gold frame mirror right back at them to see how Gilmore Girls depicts old money in the Gilmore mansion and decor. Just like Luke's diner or the inn, Richard and Emily Gilmore's house is a weekly constant. The dining room table, so well formulated that an AI is doing way too good of a job matching the energy. Who organized that? Beth. Oh, Beth. Oh, fill me in. Why do we hate Beth? Nobody said anything about hating her, Lorelai. It's the mansion that Lorelai ran away from, that Rory steals away too, and the place that Emily and Richard seem like they're trapped in amber. Getting to go here every Friday night for dinner felt like a peek into a life you'd never be invited to, and only see if you were unlucky enough to be working for the Gilmores. To truly understand Emily Gilmore and her perfectly appointed home, I wanted to go back to the pilot. Lorelai's at work, she's good at her job, she's good at making sure she's not overpaying for plumbing services, she seems less good at not overpaying for harp services. Then Lorelai gets a letter. Rory got into Chilton, which we as first time viewers now know is a good thing that everybody wants. She can finally go to Harvard like she always wanted, and do all the things that I never got to do, and then I can resent her for it. And we can finally have a mother daughter relationship. Blah, blah, blah. You get it. Lorelai has to pay $5,000 at the start of the semester, which she does not have which means she has to take a trip to Hartford, Connecticut, the insurance capital of the world. Hartford city flag reads post nubula Phoebus, which isn't a new wave experimental Phoebe Bridgers project, but instead means after the clouds, the sun in Latin. But it seems for Lorelai, this trip is mostly clouds. This is how we get the first glimpse of Lorelai's parents' house, a big stone Tudor house that looks like Dracula found stability in paper pushing. And just like Dracula, there is a negotiation for our protagonist to help their child have a better life. But like all negotiations, it comes at a cost, eternal devotion. Oh wait, no, uh, Friday night dinners. When Lorelai comes in, she says, The place looks great. And Emily says, It hasn't changed. The funny part is it's about to change a lot. The pilot filmed Emily and Richard's house at this house in Toronto, Canada, both interior and exterior. But after the show was picked up, a house was built on the Warner Brothers lot that was meant to match the interior we had already seen. But the Tudor exterior, which felt very Gothic, was replaced with a French eclectic exterior. I know all the words I'm using sound like canceled Showtime shows, but they are both house styles that were popular in the early 1900s in the US. Both of them are also referred to as eclectic styles, which was when people were taking inspiration inspiration from previous architectural styles, but really crafting something new. At one of these Friday night dinners, as Lorelai and Emily are fighting about if Rory should golf with Richard, we can get a view of the sitting room, both in how it's decorated, but also how Emily wields it. The room is the epitome of ornate, chairs with gilded arms and legs, gold frames, a marble fireplace, assorted urns, wall molding. It's hard to pinpoint specific styles in furniture and decor, especially in movies and television, since just like our houses, they're just grabbing relevant furniture from wherever they can get it. So that means you wouldn't know if a chair was an original, a revival, or a restoration. And the time period of the furniture and the style is kind of vague, but it's certainly not very 2000. You would never question the time period or the style of it because I at least feel so confident in Emily's ability to know what's appropriate, even sacrificing comfort for it. In Lorelai and Emily's fight about the Gilmore golfs, Emily is initially backed into the corner with her ornate chair, but it's not for long. She conversationally takes the upper hand and as she sits down on a very feminine chair with an embroidered floral pattern on a pink fabric that looks like it was exported from Marie Antoinette's quarters, she has completely flipped control of the conversation. Her ability to take an accusation of manipulation and then invert it through manipulation, all while coolly sitting down is scary and impressive. You win. Thank you. And I think it speaks to her control in her arena, her house. And each room somehow strikes this balance between what's defined as feminine and masculine. And beyond gender, this house just feels proper and precise. Wait, that photo wasn't of her house. No, that's a photo of a dollhouse made in 1948. It's currently in a museum in Seattle, but it somehow manages to capture the same style and energy of the Gilmore sitting room. And I think a lot of sets can have that dollhouse effect. But in this case, it's clear that this house is decorated like an old fashioned dollhouse with rooms that feel designed to be viewed from a specific angle. And I'm not the only one seeing the dollhouse connection. Amy Sherman Palladino says, the house looked like a dollhouse, especially in season one. Quote, we always had this issue with the Gilmore house where we didn't have a lot of money that first season. So it was a little tiny and it kind of looked like Ed was in a dollhouse. 
He was a very tall man and the next year we had a little bit more money so we could make a room a little bigger. They made the set bigger by season two and they seemed comfortable adding more to the home as it was relevant to the storyline, making over time their house actually match the grand idea that we had for it. And if you're wondering how I found a dollhouse that matched the Gilmore Mansion, I'm currently working on a video about dollhouses in preparation for the Barbie movie. Here's my book. Look, this book. This is the woman. Um, she also made this dollhouse. Anyway, that's coming soon, so subscribe so you can be the first to see it. I'm gonna get back into the nebulous, wealthy timelessness of this house and how that timelessness works into our perceptions of old money versus the reality of it. But first, I wanna talk about how mean this family can be. The show is designed around what a fun conversationalist Lorelai is. And meeting her parents, you can see where she gets her quickness from. In the skill tree, it seems like Lorelai has been putting all of her points to being funny, which I respect and is where I also like to put my points. While Emily has been training for years at the subtle art of being offensive in a way that's hard to explain to other people. And I like this coat of yours. There's something nice about simple cloth. Thanks. She never said anything directly bad about me or the diner or anything else concerning me. She's good. And that was the most notable thing rewatching season one. Lorelai will say something with the intention of being rude and then is met by her parents' covert rudeness that is 50 times more brutal. In these early episodes in the first season, we see the most cutting version of Emily and Richard with none of the warmness that evolves as you get to know them. And those subtle stinging insults mean we must talk about the wasp in the room. Wait, I didn't know there was a wasp in my flowers. Oh, not that type of wasp, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Emily and Richard Gilmore are quintessential wasps. They are from old wealthy families. Richard went to Yale, Emily went to Smith. They both seem to be fulfilling a prophecy that is generations old, which Lorelai rejected. Starting her independent life at 16 wasn't just a rebuttal of their parenting. It was a questioning of their entire society, their parents, their peers. It interrogates their purpose. And that isn't a place they seem particularly comfortable. And then when the show starts, they are reveling in their granddaughter returning to this world that they care so much about and her seeing some value in it, even if it just starts with a desire for knowledge and education. Now let's walk on over to the dining room through the wood paneled hallway and talk about how this house is kind of a time capsule. Like why does this dining room look closer to what I've seen in Downton Abbey versus a dining room I've actually eaten in? And that's coming from me, a person who likes eating with candles on the table. Gilmore Girls starts in the year 2000, but in every video I've mentioned how it's definitely hearkening back to something further in the past. A time when city centers were mixed use, mortgages were attainable, when rich people's dining rooms looked like still lifes. I must grab my next prop. I was at a very full bookstore in Tacoma, Washington, and outside was a 25 cent shelf where I found this architectural digest from September 1983. And in it are ads that wanted to be seen by the Emily Gilmores of the world. Family on heirloom rug. Sad man in room with wine. Chairs that look like they were directly taken from her house. There is a wide variety of spaces shown in this magazine. A place that looks like the Collins vacation home, a New York City apartment with a cozy table, or a restaurant fever dream in Houston. And then there is the cover story. We're going to Burt Reynolds' house. This is the AD tour before YouTube. Burt Reynolds is known for being an actor and sex symbol. He seems very different from the Gilmores. So why to the untrained eye does his dining room look kind of like the Gilmores? I always think about how the further you get away from a time period, the more it all starts to blend together, especially with what came before it. I know there's nuances to these images, but I'm seeing all the things in common, the tapered candles, the huge table, the volume of dishes, the chairs that look like cellos, and the two big floral centerpiece. You might wanna call a house like the Gilmores the blueprint. They're supposed to be old money, but they're imitating too. An old wealthy American family with beautiful antiques, making a house that wants to be mistaken for an English Lord's manor, but really they're just in Connecticut. It's an imitation game, but not that one. It seems like we can never get away from wanting to imitate the wealth of the past. And I think the 80s were the beginning of a time when these wealth markers could be taken on by anyone who had enough expendable income and cared enough to do it. Ralph Lauren will sell you a polo shirt even if you don't know what polo is. 
Martha Stewart will tell you what to serve in the Hamptons even if you've never been. There was a monetization of the idea of wealth that meant everything old money had been holding on to so tightly, keeping secret as a type of code, was superficially open to the public. All of those wealth markers became something for public consumption. Because you can make a lot more money when you target everyone with money versus people with old money. And something that makes Gilmore Girls feel like a secret club is being shown a type of wealth that feels so old and private. And it looks very different than the type of wealth that I tend to see. Because right now I can't stay out of rich people's houses. They are clawing for my attention just like everyone else. Look at them all, desperately wanting me to see the carpeting in their bathroom. Now, so far, I haven't talked about a year in the life because it feels like a bad dream that makes me sad. But the one thing that pulls it from the depths is the Emily Gilmore plotline, where she mourns the loss of Richard, moves out of their home and into a place in Nantucket. And this Nantucket house is a big departure from the style we've seen her appreciate so far. She's gone full coastal Nancy Myers. Prepare the kitchen that no one's ever gonna cook in. Clean whites, shabby chic furniture. It's also a house that looks pretty comfortable a place with chairs you might actually want to sit in, which is a big step up for Emily. There's a scene where she's at the DAR meeting interviewing potential members. She seems to tear down the curtain on how this world works, breaking from the polished Emily Gilmore we've seen for seasons. And although it can be cathartic for her to discredit the damaging system, this is the same system she has upheld to keep her way of life for decades. She put a strict culture's needs above the needs of her child and tried to mold her daughter and her granddaughter to better fit within the societal space she had allotted for them instead of changing the system to better fit the people she loved. Emily has been disparaging and firing her staff since we've been introduced and has all these women wearing gray maid outfits that look like they're from the 1930s, even in a year in the life, which was 2016. Let them wear pants. I can appreciate the character of Emily and her evolution and my god the acting of Kelly Bishop. But I also think it's too little too late. But that didn't stop me from tearing up when we saw Richard's gold frame portrait that fit so perfectly in the home they created together, being transported to a place meant to be Emily's fresh start, a representation of what she was leaving behind, also being a reminder of the person she wished she could have kept with her forever. It's like got me tearing up. <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Gilmore Mansion. I think there is plenty of stuff I didn't get to say and I would consider doing a part two. Now that we've all cried together, I want to invite you to my internet house, which has lots of different rooms. One of them is clearly Gilmore themed. And all you have to do to come in is subscribe. You all also help me shape this video with your responses to my community post. And so thank you for all being geniuses. If you want to help me be more successful on YouTube, Watch my two latest videos. Uh, I did a reaction to the Octagon House and Mother, and then I also did a video on diners and cheap food and cafeterias. It was fun. And yeah, subscribe. I'm Kendra Gaylord. Bye.